1370 WOCA. Four minutes, 24 minutes before 11 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. Once a while ago, we went to see uh, the museum down in St. Petersburg of Salvador Dali. Remember the artist Salvador Dali? Oh, yeah. He's, that's a wonderful we're museum. Down there. We were looking at a painting, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but I've, I seem to remember looking at a painting, and somebody said, do you see the matador? And I said, no, where's the matador? Mm-hmm. And, and, he, and Salvador Dali had hidden in, in the painting a, a, a matador. And um, then when I saw it, I couldn't not see it. Mm-hmm. It was one of those. And, and I guess he was very, very good at this. And I'm, I don't, I don't, I'm not an art. I'm not knowledgeable in art. I have no idea. But it seems like that must have been his thing, right? I don't know. And the painting was like 10 feet tall by... You know, 10 it was, feet was, wide. It was hu- or twenty feet tall by ten feet wide. It, it was, was huge, very large, and bigger than life. And that is great, Robin, because what I'm trying to do here is to make a comparison between the stories that I've read so far in and uh, the uh, the L. Ron Hubbard presents Writers of the Future books. This is the volume thirty one. It's the one we've been talking about recently. Mm-hmm. But when you think about what a writer of the future might write about. You know, if you didn't know anybody, you would think it was about rocket ships, it was about time machines, it was about, you know, space travel, etc. Mm-hmm. But you know, there's something hidden in it, just like that matador was hidden in the Dolly painting. Yes. And usually what's hidden in it is like, um, you know, uh, hu- human kindness or, or uh, like, like ethical values and things like that. They're, they're, they're embedded in the story. Mm-hmm. And you don't even realize you're being exposed to something that's actually teaching you something or at least e- e- emphasizing something of importance beyond, you know, flying through space and, 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 and zapping aliens or something like that. Uh, John Goodwin has been with us before. He's on the phone again. Did I hear you say he just got home or something? Yes, he did. He's probably got jet lag right now. <laughs> uh, and He's in California, too. And so good morning, John. John is, uh, oh God, you're the head guy, aren't you, with Galaxy Press. So good morning, John. Good morning, Larry. I don't know what to call you. The head guy. That's, that's, the, best I can, that's the best I can do. So where did you... I'm, where, the guy you're, I'm the guy you're talking to right now. <laughs> where did you get back from? Where were you? No, I was just... I was just on Robin. I was in Orange County last night. I got a phone call. I was um, in seeing some people on, on business, and I got this call from... Uh, or a text from... Um, Carmen. Carmen saying... Uh, so would you prefer 7 o'clock or 7.30? <laughs> and, uh, and I said, well, 7.30 if I have a choice. I said, when, pray tell, is this? He said, tomorrow morning, of course. And I went, ah. <laughs> so oh I got home last night about, about 1.30. And then um, oh. I've got, as long as I had my trusty little morning uh, shower and cup of coffee, then I was like, okay, good, I'm, I'm good to go here. And I brought all my stuff with me so I could be uh, sound like I'm knowing I'm talking about, which I've actually done pretty good with. So um, it's uh, it's interesting what you say then about writers of the future, though. Just that was the purpose of the program was it was an adjunct to what what uh, Ellen Hubbard's purpose was for science fiction, getting back into the field because he saw that science fiction is the herald of possibility. And so when he did his uh, reentry with Battlefield Earth and later with Mission Earth, he was. Um, he was heralding back to what the golden age of science fiction was all about when he was called into the offices at Street and Smith back in the 1940s. So it was just, it's really interesting that you observe that because um, it is what it's about, and that's why these stories in Writers of the Future are sort of appropriate from middle school all the way up through um, any age you know, above that to appreciate different forms of science fiction and fantasy. Yeah, and it is Im- it is embedded. It's like hidden, and 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 I'm wondering how many. Oh gosh, I don't want to say young readers because it's probably all age readers. But I wonder how many readers. So just I guess end with that conclusion. Don't see it until maybe they read it the second time, or so, or they're discussing it with somebody. I wonder how many times it it goes over their heads. That's a that's a good point. But that's what I think is good about the the series as well, because it has so many different stories. You know, with uh, we've got the twelve winners, and then we also add, add a finalist, and then now we've added um, short stories from 
science fiction is great. So of course, Mr. Hubbard's got a story in there, but like Larry Niven, Orson Scott Card, Kevin Anderson, um, these are all authors that are proven over over time to be the um, the ones that really carried forward that message of science fiction's purpose, or at least one of the purpose of science fiction, which sees sees the future with science as more of a um, it's a solution to man's dilemma. It's not like the formation of man's dilemma, like in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And since right. these uh, uh, submissions are entered by quarter, are you still judging the fourth quarter? Is there still time for somebody to enter now? Very good question. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the the fourth quarter and the end of the year for uh, the 31st or for the 32nd volume and um, the end of this month, and so there's very much still time. And what's good, we, we implemented this a few years ago, that a, um, an aspiring writer could enter the contest by going to the website as well and just uploading their story. And one thing people have to realize too, I was just talking to somebody yesterday when they called in to enter, it's all um, blind judging. So it's strictly a merit alone that a, um, a winner is acknowledged and so when you enter the contest, you have a, a cover page, but then you upload your story and you, your name's not on the story. But what it'll be is the judges when they read it, it's just by, is that a good story or not that it makes it through the, uh, the judging process to be a, um, a finalist or a winner. So they definitely have until the end of this month to enter to, to make it into the 32nd year. R- writing and illustrating, correct? Correct. And nice. both contests can be found at writersofthefuture.com. You can enter the Writers' Contest or the Illustrators' Contest, whichever you prefer. You, you were in Atlanta for the Dragon Con? Um, we were. I was the night before I was supposed to go. Somebody came up to the office, and I had to quickly get somebody else to fly in my stead. But we had a, a booth there, and uh, half a dozen of our judges were there at Dragon Con. Um, it's one of my favorite shows. I love, I love attending it, and it was... Um, Unfortunate that I didn't get it. Pat Henry, who's the uh, the main guy um, who runs the show, came to our booth and was like, went to uh, the other guy said, "Where's John? I didn't give you this booth, so I didn't have no John here." And so it was it was fun, you know. She said how it was uh, um, totally huh. you know, the reception for all the published books. And Battlefield Earth is actually one of the favorite books for Dragon Con. Oh uh, really? Oh wow! Yeah, it's just. It's received a Dragon Award, and next year when we come out with probably what's going to be the, the big re-release of it with the graphic novel, with the unabridged audiobook, is going to be, um, we'll do that at, at Dragon Con. They've got a big blood drive there. Um, with Life South. Behind- what's that? With, with the Life South Community Blood Centers. Yeah, and it's, um, uh, the high, it's called the Highline Blood Drive, and they'll, they'll raise 2,500 to 3,000 pints of blood at that thing. But because Robert Heinlein and, and L. Ron Hubbard were, were best friends in, um, you know, growing up, uh, we'll, t- we'll do a tie-in on that one there, too, so that anybody that donates will give them a, a free copy of uh, the first, probably the first uh, comic book from um, the Battle for the series, just as uh, a recognition. We'll, we'll have a special edition that has, like, a, Heinle- a flood with Heinlein and Hubbard or something like that together. Oh wow. wow! Oh wow! I that didn't, I so didn't know cool. that part of this. Yeah, we we speak yeah. to uh, Galen Newnold from Life South every mo- every morning, and he was up there in in uh, uh, in Atlanta yeah. for Dragon yeah. Con. Yeah, he uh, spearheads it. Yeah, he was having he was having awesome. he was having a good time de- describing the the men who were <laughs> a little on the heavy side wearing Wonder Woman <laughs> costumes. <laughs> Sometimes it gets, it's, it's, sometimes it's very obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll take a little break. We'll be right back. John, I always love chatting with you, uh, but don't go away. We'll be right back. John Goodwin, uh, the president of Galaxy Press. And by the way, if you're young, if you're a writer, I always say young. You don't have to be young. No. If you're a writer no. and you want to submit a, 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 a writing or an illustrator, you yes. want to illustrate a, a, send an illustration. We'll explain it when we come back, if you don't already know. But it's free. I love that part that it's free. We'll take a break and be right back.
weather is brought to you by MyFWC.com. Safe boating is no accident. It'll be partly sunny today with a shower or thunderstorm in spots this afternoon. The high today, 89 to 93. Partly cloudy tonight, though, 73 to 77. For tomorrow, times of clouds and sun with a shower or thunderstorm around, mainly during the afternoon hours over the interior. The high tomorrow, 88 to 92. And for Saturday, intervals of clouds and sun along with a couple of showers and thunderstorms. The high, 84 to 88. From the Florida Weather Center, I'm meteorologist Joe Bunberg. On this episode of What Not To Do, brought to you by Mike Scott Plumbing. If water runs through it, we do it. I thought I told you to call Mike Scott Plumbing to get this leak fixed. I did call the plumbers. They were just here. Let me get this straight. You're telling me Mike Scott Plumbing was just here? Uh, well, not exactly. Well, then who exactly was here? You know, the other plumbers. They were having a sale. Is that why there's duct tape on my toilet? Wait, I don't see any, uh, oh, that duct tape. Uh, well, at least it matches the grout color. There's a reason we only call Mike Scott Plumbing. They're on time every time. They don't charge extra for nights, weekends, or holidays. And most importantly, and I need you to pay attention on this part, they actually fix it. Okay, so you want me to try to fix it? Yes, yes I do. By calling Mike Scott Plumbing, like you should have done in the first place. Yes, dear. What's the number again? You really should know this by heart. 866-314-4443. Got it. 866-314-4443. On next week's episode of What Not To Do. Seriously? A helicopter? One of the most common questions those nearing retirement are asking, will I outlive my money? Retirement questions like these and many more will be answered every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. on planning for a better and safer retirement with hosts Francois and Julian Cozanet. Francois and Julian will help you put your retirement puzzle together. Catch planning for a better and safer retirement Saturdays at 9 a.m. on Ocala's News Talk, The Source 96.3 FM and 1370 a.m. All right, 12 minutes before 11 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. One of my favorite guests is yeah. John Goodman. In fact, in fact, they've been so kind uh, at Galaxy Press to enable us to speak to so many of their authors and, and uh, illustrators. It just sounds like a lot of fun. Do you know what I want to ask you, John? How did the uh, workshop go? Was it like a week or two ago? How did that go? It was two weeks ago. It was an amazing success. We'd not done it before, so it was a bit of like, let's see what's going to happen. We suspected it would be okay, but just we weren't sure what was all going to be the various things that we didn't predict. <clears throat> because we've done it so for so many years for the winners. This is now the first time we, met, we opened it up for aspiring writers. So we had Orson Scott Card was there, which was just, you know, everybody was just gaga over that. And then uh, we had Dave Farland, Dave Wolverton, um, his pen name is Dave Farland, who's just a brilliant writer. And he's the one that teaches and runs the, uh, the writer's workshop for the Writers of Future winners, and he's also the uh, coordinating judge for the whole contest. And he won the vo- he won the contest in in uh, volume three, so he's just been a very very successful writer since. And then we had Kevin and Rebecca Anderson that were there, and then uh, uh, I think some girls you recently met uh, the Winter Twins, Brittany and Brianna. Right, two right. Incredible live wires. They're just like <laughs> yeah, they were twins. They were fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was it was great. We had about uh, a little over sixty people that uh, that came in. We had people come in from thirteen different states to do the workshop, and they were just uh, it was it was a very time intensive two days. It started first thing on Saturday, um, went to dinner time, and then we all went across the street and had a big pizza party. And then afterwards, they came back to our um, we transformed while we were at having at their dinner <clears throat> was we transformed where they were doing the workshop to the theater, so they, they attended a, um, a live show, which they really enjoyed, and then, and then Sunday all day again, where they finished the workshop. So it was, it was very, very successful, and we're gonna schedule another one again in January, because um, it was, you know how people say, I can't make that one, but let me know when the next one is, because I really wanna come. Did you, as a younger person, did you go to workshops like that? I'm guessing when you, when you go to something like that, and you have, I mean, everybody's, in it for the same reasons that you want to learn you want to teach uh you want to walk away with something that you didn't have before you went, entered into that so I'm, I'm guessing some of those writers probably you know what it would be for me I, I wouldn't i would be so impatient to get back to writing once i was exposed to something like that well that was the idea because some of these people um we had some of our, our writers of future winners from a couple of years ago they wanted to come back and get more questions answered because now they just got more experience under the belt uh, some people, um, one one uh, couple was um, attending. They do um, 
they write magazines that they're actually a marketing company for uh, dentists and um, they write magazines and so they wanted to be able to get more just the, the technology of writing itself, how do you put together interesting copy. It's not that they're writing fiction at all, but they're like, how do you put words together because um, Gordon Scott Carr is just a master of writing, he writes both fiction and nonfiction. So his, his use of tense and person is just like, you thought people just like, they couldn't keep up fast enough keeping notes with what he was talking about. Because he's just, uh, he's a, a, a wordmeister. You know, so that was really good just alone with him. So it was, so a lot of people were very anxious to get back, but they had questions and you, you know, they were just totally gravitating around the judges and the speakers um, during all the different breaks, which was really good. They very much appreciated that. The one thing that's interesting, which I don't think Carmen mentioned to you, um, what we did in this workshop is we're taking various different tangents for Rise of the Future because it's proven to be so successful over the last three plus decades that uh, we are also doing a program now to get Rise of the Future creative writing program into colleges and universities. And uh, we started this program, we attended the International Literary Association a uh, few months back at the end of July, which was in um, um, in the Midwest. I forget right now what city it was in, but it was there. And it was um, very, very successfully held where we had a lot of uh, the teachers and professors were uh, very, it was in St. Louis, were very um, interested in having some material and about half of them had heard about the concept, the other half had, you know, were saying like, why haven't I heard about this? And so, not knowing what we were going to find in terms of reception on this, there were um, about 220 different uh, uh, teachers and professors of creative writing signed up for this program wanting to do it. So we've been working to get these um, programs being implemented in colleges around the United States. And at the very end, when they had their keynote speaker, there was this... Um, basketball guy by the name of Shaquille O'Neal. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so he was there, and, um, and he was speaking at that as a keynote address to the 5,000 plus uh, lot of teachers that were there. And um, so when he was presenting a copy of the book, it was fun. It was, he, had, he had such, I mean, the guy's a, a walking mountain. He's so <laughs> big. But he has this whole entourage of, of guards just, uh, I guess, to help people off. So when... Um, our, our person that was there approached him to, uh, they're trying to walk her away, but he got, she got his attention. They said, no, I want to see what she wanted to show. So she showed him a copy of the book, Writers of the Future, and uh, he got it. And um, he just says, you know, that sounds great. I want that book. And so with that, his, his, you know, his acceptance of that in front of all the different uh, teachers and professors there is just continuing to grow as a, um, as a real solution to this because there's so many incredible essays written by Mr. Hubbard. Each year there's a different essay published, but there's also now a course that we put together that's available. And now we're also working on putting together an online course so people from outside of the United States can actually sign up and do this program too. That one will probably be as a, a free no charge course where the end result is that people will enter the contest because the main thing that, um, you know, the, the biggest mistake you make in writing, and this is, you know, was on one of the panels that we did at the Dragon Con. You know, I said, well, what's your greatest mistake? And you had these other editors saying, you know, um, to do this and somebody else has to do that and all these really poor stories. And then the worst thing you can do in writing is to not write and complete your story. That's the actual worst thing. Because then you finish it, then you start your next one, and then eventually you get to the point where you've got a voice, and then with the voice you can get more interest generated. Uh -huh. And it's, and it's more than mom or wife or husband that says, this is really good, honey. The, absolutely, wow. yeah. Because the, I mean, you, yeah, you have to get past them. Do, do, do you know what I, I wanted to point out? I went to Amazon. It's very rare to see 253 reviews. Mm -hmm. And the 253 v reviews end up with a 4.8 out of 5 stars. And sometimes what I do on Amazon is I look at the lowest ratings just to see why they're giving it a lower rating. Sometimes it'll be because Amazon messed up. It's not has nothing to do with the book. Um, but e but even the three star one and three star is the lowest anybody gave it, and only three percent of the people gave it a three star. Seventy eight percent gave it a five star. Nineteen percent gave it a four star. But even the three star ones are are gushing about the book. So these are these, some of these uh, you know armchair critics are yeah. re are really tough on you. Yeah. But but. 
but they're still giving it they when in the write-up i was looking at one write-up for example and it said this is the first line this is a three-star review why he gave it three stars i don't know but he, he says writers of the future is quite easily one of if not the most prestigious contest in the world for speculative short fiction the contest runs each quarter of the year with the top three stars it goes on and on to tell what you've been ta- telling us all along john but uh, 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 but anyway but most of them are giving it five stars but my point is even the three star guys are gushing yeah they're gushing <laughs> so you can't I, I, that's i love that I, I, I love that so um gosh you so and what that t- says to me is that the judges really knew what to look for the writers yeah. really knew what to write um and those who came back i can't remember was it was it jw alden who said he had tried for several years before he finally got mm-hmm. got in there so you know, that's our new one that's our new winner for volume 32 okay so he so he the feedback that the writers get from the judges helps yeah, helps yeah. to uh what's a good word groom mm-hmm. helps to groom the writers to become the writers they've always wanted to be yeah no other yeah. contest does that none mm-hmm. no and the price is totally right because it doesn't cost them a penny the whole thing of this of the contest is to provide for the future of speculative fiction you know and that's why um it, it was funny I, because i couldn't make it to the at Dragon Con, so Emily, um, who also works with us at, uh, at Office Services and Galaxy Press, had to stand in for me. She sat down there and just like, who is this person? And I said, look, you'll have to go there a few minutes early and just introduce yourself and apologize. And as soon as they saw the Rise of Future book, they went, ah, okay, good. And so she was given um, some considerable latitude just to start talking about the contest and the panel. And it was the acceptance is so good, and at the, there was about 150 people. It was a, on creative writing at this workshop, and it was just uh, after people knew what the right of the future was, and afterwards, as happens to me too, you get mobbed with people with a lot of questions. What about this? What about this? How can I do that? And it's just it's so well accepted because it's there's no ulterior motive on it. It's not like okay, we're going to use this to capture and make a hoard of money with your material that we now own. It's you retain all your re- rights to your works. This year's grand prize winner just turned 60 last month. So there's, it's strictly by merit alone. It's not, you know, in publishing, you don't want to take some in that's too old because their, you know, their life curve is almost over type thing is, is part of the mentality. And here it's just, you know, if you're good, you submit, you win. We have no idea. If yeah. You, your yeah. age, your nationality, your sex, anything. And I love that part of this too. Yeah, it's absolutely. Uh, John, I, I know you must be exhausted. Thank you so much for being on the air with us this morning. I love chatting with you. One of these days we'll get to meet with you. And Yeah. Gosh, I, I would love that somebody great. Somebody from Macau. We've had somebody from the villages, so that's yes, as close yeah. as we've had. So. <laughs> Well, did you ever make it out to LA? I mean, I, I keep on asking it, but in April, April 10th is when we have volume 32, our award ceremony here in Hollywood. And it's just considered, to, you know, if something can be worked out where all of a sudden a business opportunity comes up and you can tweak it so it ends up around there. That would be awesome. Um, it, it's an amazing event. It really, awesome. really is. All right, John, thank you again. And uh, and I can't wait to chat with you next. Get some sleep. We'll be, we'll be, we'll be right back. <laughs> Casting from the Paddock Mall Studios, this is WOCA, Ocala, Gainesville, The Villages, 1370 AM, 963 FM, The Source. News Radio. I'm Lillian Wu. The Iran nuclear deal now facing possible new obstacles on Capitol the Hill. The House is no longer considering a resolution of disapproval. Instead, a series of measures, including a straight up or down vote on accepting the Iran deal, is planned. Another resolution would also challenge whether the president has given Congress every detail of the agreement. Fox Radio's Jared Halpern. Armed civilian patrols showing up on a stretch of highway in Phoenix, Arizona, where someone's been firing on drivers, some now avoiding Interstate 10. It is scary. It makes me more cautious to, to be in that stretch and uh, and for everybody else that they could get hurt or get shot you know luckily nobody's been killed as of yet somebody's uh, playing games and i choose not to play that game so i don't use the tent the only injury a teenage girl cut when a windshield shattered in a car fox radio's rich jennison and jobless claims for last week dipping to two hundred seventy-five thousand. fox news we report you decide mm-hmm. 
right now at the Home Depot. Save 20% when you buy one or more pallets of in-stock GAF shingles. So, let's raise the roof and lower the cost with bulk pricing on top-of-the-line GAF shingles, including Timberline, America's favorite shingle. This is worth shouting from the rooftops. Let's do this. Save 20% on one or more pallets of in-stock GAF shingles at the Home Depot. More saving. More doing. Valid through September 30th, U.S. only. See store for details. I'm a pair of designer shoes so expensive my owner had to give up half decaf skim vanilla lattes just to afford me. So you can imagine my terror when a pipe burst and the apartment started flooding. There I was, trapped in the closet, water rushing all around me. But what was I to do? I'm a six-inch stiletto. It's not like I can run. Your stuff can't protect itself. That's why the GEICO Insurance Agency helps make it easy to switch and save on renter's insurance. Renter's insurance will cover personal property loss or damage as well as provide liability protection. Visit GEICO.com today. It's time for Farmer Ranch Headlines on the Southeast Agnet. I'm Tyron Spearman reporting. Don Kaler with the Georgia Peanut Commission is visiting with us today. Don, tell us a little bit about the Georgia crop. You know, we've got uh, really a, a fantastic looking crop overall. There are some areas that are dry. We've got some dry land, non-irrigated peanuts that if it's in those dry areas, they're they're struggling a little bit, turning loose from the shell and going to be time to get them out. But uh, overall, this crop really looks good this year. We've got a lot of acres of peanuts, so I think we're going to have enough to supply every consumer that wants something. How about logistics? I know it's going to be a trouble moving them around in a hurry. How do you see it lining up? You know, I have seen them already starting in the southwest corner of the state. The early peanuts are being harvested. Some of the problem peanuts where there's a disease issue or or whatever. But it uh, seems like we're spread out pretty good. And uh, so I've got to believe that because we've got these semi-drying wagons now, there are trailers that, that they're doing that we can handle this crop and do a pretty good job of it. I think the big challenge comes in 16. We're telling farmers right now with the size of this crop, the warehouses may not get emptied out by the time of the 16 harvest. So they better be sure they've got a warehouse receipt or they can't get a loan in the loan program. Coming up next week is the uh, Georgia Peanut Tour. Don, tell us a bit of it. Uh, you know, we're, we're excited to go to some place that uh, is new as far as our home base. We're going to be in Thomas County, a beautiful part of Georgia right there. It's down in the heart of the plantation country. Uh, and we're in the whole southwest corner of the state. So uh, we've got a great tour. We've got a big registration right now. It's uh, maybe as big as we've ever had as far as number of people registered. Uh, so we're excited about that prospect. And they'll be able to see everything from the farm all the way through to the shelling plants and, uh, and you know, our peanut industry. Don Kaler, Georgia Peanut Commission. Get the crop in. I'm Tyron Spearman for Southeast Agnet. <music> Ocala Aviation now has opportunities for flight instructors. Wait, hold on, Brad, is this correct? You're looking for instructors, not students? Actually, we're looking for both. Well, that's descriptive. Well, I need flight instructors because we're now affiliated with a major university and can offer four-year degrees, plus we're also approved to work directly with VA students. Okay, so a degree in what, and what's a VA student? Well, it's a bachelor's degree in aeronautics, which includes a commercial pilot's license, and there's financial aid available. By VA students, I mean veterans. They now have access to new 